you make your website go live, all right? And I, I say this for two reasons. I go over this for two reasons. First of all, I think it is good to sort of close the loop. You know, we, we talk about how you develop websites, and we talk about the languages that you use, and the process that you go through to develop a website. Um, and, and yet, we never talk about the last step. Or, or, or it's important to talk about the last step. And that's what, that's what I'm doing now, is talk about like, okay, you have the website working, you're happy with it, um, your client, if you're developing it for someone, is happy uh, with it, so now what do you do? You know, how, how do you make it go live? And we talked about the process. First of all, you register a domain, and a domain is um, the, the address, the www.something.com, or dot, what are the other dots, dot net, or dot gov, or dot edu. Those are restricted. You have to be a government agency or a educational facility to uh, use those domains. But you register a domain, all right? Uh, .org is the other one that I wasn't able to think of a minute ago. There's a few of those. Um, so you register a domain. So, so that, that gives you that domain so no one else can have it. Uh, we were talking about in lab, actually, or after class, I was talking about with the student, sometimes companies um, will register slight variations of the name just in case, like, someone misspells it. They get, they get directed to the right domain. And, and that, that's usually a good idea. Or, yes? I did get that to work. I did a, um, in GoDaddy, I went in and you can do a 301 redirect. Okay, a redirect, exactly. Yeah, and then I put the, the other spelling in there. Right. The so it, it takes you right to where you pointed to. Exactly. And, and that, that's what people do. So, like, let's say if I had the Zellers Company Incorporated, for example. I could register Zellers.com, I could or uh, register ZellersCo.com, I could register ZellersInc.com, and ZellersCoInc.com, all, right, all the different variations of it. And I could have them all go and get directed to the same website. So I wouldn't have to create a bunch of different websites. I'd have one website, and these three addresses would be pointing to the same place. So first thing you do is you register a domain. Second thing you do is you get uh, an internet hosting service. Now, you could theoretically host the, the site yourself on a computer that was connected to the internet that was running a web server. The problem with that is, is that's a lot of work to do. It's not necessarily a lot of work getting it set up, but it's a lot of work making sure that your web server software, and web server software is a software that needs to be running on the machine, that waits for, that listens for web requests, and responds to them. Well, to keep those up to date with latest security patches and all that is really a pain. Plus, you have to make backups of it and so on and so forth. So, therefore, it's much better if, you know, in, in many cases, unless you're a large company that can devote a lot of resources to it, even large companies will, will sort of farm that out to someone else. All right? So, uh, a lot of times you can combine those two things into one. So, you can use the same company, like GoDaddy was the example that a student gave in class, to register the domain and provide the hosting. All right. So once you have that, you're ready then to put your materials up on the web. And you can do that a couple different ways. A lot of web hosting companies have a, a web page that allows you to go and post stuff up to your site. And a lot of companies, um, uh, and if they don't have that, which almost all of them do, you can use just what's called a standard FTP program. FTP stands for File, File Transfer Protocol. And it's just like logging into Canvas. You have your user ID and password. That shows that you have permission to upload files. You know, you wouldn't want anyone turning in your assignments, right? Well, maybe you would. Right? I, guess, I guess it depends on who it is, right? Uh, but you would want, you know, you would not want anyone to update your website. Let's put it that way, right? So make sure you have the credentials to log in, and then you can go and you can uh, put stuff up, and then it will be available for everyone. So if we could have the lights turned off for a second, for well, for a while, all right? Here's here's uh, a website that we did a long time ago. One of the prototypes that we did. And notice that it was LCCC, and we had all our links to these different pages, or some of the different pages. We had, I think, three of them. All right. And notice that we have these folders. 
Now this is where it comes in. Remember I said before that um, if you're going to put something in another folder, don't put the full path. So I would not put C colon desktop prototype 3 dash prototypes. I would refer to the CSS file by saying simply from this web page you go down to the CSS folder and then that's the name of the file. So I'm using what's called a relative path. Now that will be important when I put it up on the server because all I have to make sure is that these pages and these files and directories are positioned in the same way relative to each other. So I'm going to go log into my web server, uh, my web hosting company. And I hope I remember the password. And this site uses cPanel, which is a very popular tool for uploading stuff. So it'll ask me for my credentials. Maybe. There we go. My username and password. Let me try to remember this. I think I do. That's a problem with saving your password, right? Then you forget it. It's like I don't know anyone's telephone numbers anymore, right? Because they're in. So you got to send that new phone, send number uh, request out to people. So, ah, so what do you know? I logged in. All right. So I go to File Manager. And this is going to look kind of like a, just a directory structure on my, on my computer, right? Here are all the things with the little folder icons or folders. All the things without it are files. All my pages are in a folder called public HTML, so I'll go into that. And what I can do is I can create uh, a new folder to put this stuff in. So I'm going to go and I'm going to say create a folder. And I'm going to, I'm going to call that folder 216. That will put it on the top of the list. So create new folder. So now there's a folder called 216. I'm going to click that. And notice what I have on this end. I have a folder that says images and a folder that says CSS. So I'm going to create those two folders. So I'm going to create a folder for images. And I'm going to create a folder for CSS. I'm going to go into the images folder. And I'm going to upload all my images. So I click upload. Select file. I think that's the only image I have, so I'll upload it. Boom, it's complete. I can close this window. I can go up a folder. Do the same thing with my CSS. Uploaded it. Close this. Go up a level. And now I can upload all of my web pages. So I'll click upload. Yes? If you had multiple images, can you upload the whole image folder at once or you have to go one by one? You, no, you can upload all the images at once. I don't think it will allow you to upload a folder, though. Okay. So you create the folder and then you upload the contents of it. So, like for example here, I'm going to upload a bunch of web pages. So I'm going to upload all four of these. So I'm just going to go, whoops, actually, it says I can drag them over. So I'm going to go and drag these files over to upload. So I can drag all of them over to upload them. And boom, they're complete. So now how do I access them? Now they're on my server, so I should be able to access them by putting in the name of my domain, the folder name, followed by 
the web page name. And there we go. And the same pages that were on my machine a minute ago are now available and are live. Um, now the other thing is, and again, the reason that this works is I kept the folders in the same structure on my web server like they were on my machine. So my folders, all my files were in a folder, except I had a CSS folder and an images folder. So I created those two folders, put the files in there, moved them, and now it doesn't matter that this is now on a web server instead of a machine because I used the relative path. I didn't put the exact location of it. I simply said, well, to get from my web page to the CSS, go down to the CSS folder, and there it is. Same thing with the images. Now, because it's named index.html, that's the default for many web servers, I can simply put in the folder name, and it will bring up the page. All right? So, if you ever notice, like when you go to a website, you don't put a page name in. You put in www.google.com. Well, how does it know what page to bring up? It brings up what's defined as the default page. And the default page is usually defined as index.html or index.php or some other standard name. Let me see if I can find that on my web server. I don't know if I don't have that option or if I just can't see what it is. Yeah, it does not show. That this is not where to do it at any rate. Okay, so that's it in a nutshell. Really, um, as you noticed, you know, there was a couple additional steps that I had to do, but in a nutshell, it's very similar to how you would upload your stuff to Canvas. You know, you just go and you say where you want to transfer your files to. All right, and there you go, and then it's live. Uh, the one thing that I didn't look on that site, um, uh, I didn't show on that site, is you can do all kinds of metrics of who is accessing your site. Like, um, to get an idea of, like, uh, how many visits you have and so on and so forth. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting uh, to do that. Almost all websites offer that. There's also plugins for many of the common software tools like WordPress and so on if you want to use those instead of authoring uh, your code. Um, I, I always believe it's a good idea to know how to write your own code even if you use one of those tools because there's some t sometimes that, that, you know, you need to understand the way the code works uh, in order to get the job done. Uh, most tools, uh, like like most websites, YouTube and so on, gives you a uh, a, a way of looking up to see uh, you know how many visitors you've had, where your visitors have come from, and, and so on, and that can be valuable from a marketing perspective. But that also can be um, how do I want to say? Um, you got to take some of it with a grain of salt because if it says it accessed your site, you don't necessarily know um, why it accessed your site. You know. It could be a search engine simply browsing the web. It also will tell you what search terms people use to get to your site. And that can be very effective for like search engine optimization. All right. If you know that, gee, that's how people get to the site, well, you know, then, then you can take some steps for that. Now this isn't a marketing class, but again, those statistics are provided to you. Okay, questions about any of that? Who did you use? Oh, that is a company called Hosting Matters. I don't know why I picked them. Uh, and I don't, I, I'm not saying that in a bad way. I mean, I made that decision ages ago, and I just never really have had any problems with them. Um, they've done a good job with support, which is a key issue. You know, there, there have been times when, you know, the web hosts have been hacked and so on that they responded very quickly. Um, I've had some questions about how to do this, that, or the other and uh, they were able to respond to them. So, you know, uh, and it's, it's pretty inexpensive. I think I pay $11 a month 
uh, and I have like unlimited space up, up there, which is a pretty, pretty good deal um, for that. So yeah, I mean, um, at the time, I did some research at the time, they looked like a good option, and they've never done anything to disappoint me. So, you know, I've, I've stuck with them. All right, next topic, again, we have two big topics. We're really winding down this semester. Which week is this? This is week 13, believe it or not, lucky 13. All right, so we have this week, next week, and the following week. So we have two big topics left. Um, we have uh, tables, and we have JavaScript. Now tables, I'm going to start out by telling you a story, and I'll keep it quick, all right? Because I could probably spend all day, you know, reminiscing about how we wrote websites back in the good old days and so on and so forth. Tables in the old days were used to get layout on an HTML page. All right, because when the web was first created, websites were really boring looking. All right, they were simply they looked like the kinds of web pages that we developed in the first week or two of class, where boom, everything was just in a line. And when marketing people started using the web, they wanted fancier layouts. They wanted layouts that looked like the brochures that they did. You know, they wanted some control over the layout. So. There really wasn't a good way to do that, again, back in the old days. So what web developers did is they used tables. And tables, you could make a grid. And anyone that's done any graphic design or read anything about graphic design know that graphic designers love grids because you can put things neatly and you can organize things and you can make columns and rows and plop things um, where you want them to be. And that worked okay for a while. However, since then, CSS has been developed. And for a while, CSS and tables were two sort of different ways to do it. People still continue to use tables because there were some problems with CSS. There were some inconsistencies with how browsers implemented it, and uh, some people had a hard time learning it, and all those things. The bottom line is today, in what year is it again? 2017, there's no reason to use tables for layout. Do not use tables for layout. Anything that you can do with tables, you can do with CSS, and you can do it better, and you can do it in a more flexible manner. Now, why do I even bring this up? I bring this up by two reasons, for two reasons. First reason is, is if you did web development for a while, you may have used tables on your website to get layouts. Stop. Don't do it anymore. All right? People used to drive horse and buggies to work, too, but we found a better way, so we don't do that anymore. All right? Question? Yeah, or doesn't the tables make the process go quicker, though? No. Does tables make the process go quicker? No. Ab absolutely not. Uh, any advantages that you might think you get from tables are reduced because of the lack of flexibility. The lack to be able to, to display the page differently on different browsers, uh, different devices, mobile devices and all that. The, the, the disadvantages far outweigh the advantage, the, any perceived advantages. So you might think it goes quicker. It goes quicker if you don't really understand CSS. Once you get comfortable with CSS, I would say it would go just as quickly with CSS as it would with tables. Um, so people that have been doing it for a long time might uh, uh, have learned to do it that way, and, and what I'm saying is don't. You know, learn, learn CSS and become comfortable with CSS and it will be better. The other thing is there is always a chance that you might, in, in a job, let's say, you might be responsible for looking at someone else's code and they may have used tables. So if you see tables used that way, um, that's why they did it back in the old days. Okay, enough, enough reminiscing. But there is still uses for tables. That's the thing. You might say, well, why are they still in the language if they're so bad? They're not so bad. They're just, you just need how to use them correctly, and you need to use, you need to know when you use them correctly. And a great example of when to use them correctly is when you really have a table of data. All right? What do I mean by a table of data? I mean, 
where you have rows and columns of data. So, for example, let me go into Word to do this. I'm always looking for Word. I forget that it's under Office. You could put a table in Word, right? And let's make four columns and five rows. So let's say I have average temperature in January, February, and March. And I do it by cities. So maybe I have Cleveland, Los Angeles, Anchorage, Alaska, and uh, Rio de Janeiro. Show the spelling of that. All right, so maybe in Cleveland, the average temperature for January is 15 degrees. Maybe for February, it's 18 degrees, and maybe for March, it's 32. In Los Angeles, maybe it's 60, 64, and 72. And Anchorage, maybe it's one degree, six degrees, and 16 degrees. And Rio, maybe it's 80. Remember, January in Rio would be there summer, right? So, ooh, it would probably be warmer. So. Maybe its average temperature is 90 in January, and 89, and 88. This is what we mean by a table of data. It's like a table that you would have in Excel, right? And what makes a table? What makes a table? What makes a table is that you have rows and columns. So you have rows, and you have columns. And to know what any data is what any piece of data is, you go and you look up to the column header and across to the row. So for example, what does 16 represent? 16 represents the temperature and anchorage for March. So you look up to the column header and across to see what row it's in. What is 60? It's the January temperature for Los Angeles. That's what we mean by a table. All right? There's really no other way to do that in HTML that we've learned so far. Let's try to do that in HTML. Let me go and Let me go and try to make a table here. Clean out all this code. So I'm going to make a table. I'm going to put it in a section. So let me try doing the same thing. say city. City. January. February. March. And I have Cleveland. Los 
Los Angeles. Anchorage and Rio de Janeiro. And I'll go and I'll just put some numbers in here. I'm not going to make sure that they match the other one because the numbers themselves aren't important. Table heading, TD, 
table data. So, let's look at this and let's recreate this in HTML. We have what? We have one table, right? The table is the collection of everything, all the rows and all the cells. The table consists of how many rows? One, two, three, four, five rows. All right? So when I do this, there's going to be one table tag. That table tag is going to contain five rows. How many cells do each row contain? Each row contains one, two, three, four cells. So each row is going to have four THs or TDs in it. Now, the way I'm going to do this table, row one is going to have all THs in it because these are headings to the columns. Rows two through five are going to have four TDs in them because that's all table data. So let's go and make this data table in HTML. So I'll make my table tag. I'm going to get rid of this, so I'm not really going to use that. Again, it doesn't matter if I don't get the numbers the same. Those aren't real numbers. I don't have temperatures memorized across the world. So there's my table tag. Now, notice what I did there, which is a good practice just in general, is as soon as I put in the star tag, I put the end tag in. You know. A lot of times if you think, well, I'll just, I'll just remember to go back and, and do it later. You know, you never remember to go back and do it later. Or oftentimes you don't remember. So there's a good rule of thumb. Whenever I put a star tag, I put the end tag immediately after it. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to indent these. I'm going to indent these so that I can clearly see how many rows and columns there are in this table. All right? That's important. It's important because you know that there's a good chance that you're going to have to come back and change this at some point in time. And if you do, it's the, the neater the code is, the easier the code is to understand and, and to follow. So I'm going to put in my first TR. Again, as soon as I put in the TR, I'm going to put the NTR. Then I'm going to indent and put the first TH city, TH, Cleveland, no, 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 not Cleveland, I want January, right, what's part of the first row? Part of the first row was the city and then the month headers. I lost my head there for a second. All right, so there's my first row. Table, first row. Header, 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 header. I'm now ready for each row after that. So I'm going to go put these are table data cells. And again, I'm not going to I'm not worried about matching the numbers, so because they're not right anyhow. So I'm just going to put in some numbers. Now, 
Now I'm going to go and I'm going to copy this row over for my other three cities. And I'll go and change that. So let's look at what we have here. We have a table. So we have one table. That table consists of how many rows? One, two, three, four, five rows. Each row has how many cells? Well, this one has four, this one has four, this one has four, this one has four, and this one has four. Most of the time, a table is going to have the same number of cells in each row. I'm not going to say always, but most of the time. All right? There are some exceptions to that, but it's a pretty safe bet that a table, most simple tables, are going to have the same number of cells in each row. And actually, even if you have a table that's more complicated, that has a bunch of, that, that has different rows with different number of cells in, sometimes it's better to simplify the table to make it so that there's only one, uh, the same number of, of cells in each, each row. So let's go and view this now. So I'll go and save it. And now when I view this page, ta-da, I get that. All right, one, two, three, four, five rows. Each row has one, two, three, four cells. Notice something about this, the THs. THs by default are bold and centered. Now it might not look like Jan, Fab, and Mar are centered but it is. All right. It's centered within the space that's allocated for that column of data. How big is each column in the, in the table? How did the browser decide how big to make everything? It resizes to the largest cell. Resizes to the largest cell. So let's look at the first column. First column, the biggest thing is the word Rio de Janeiro. So therefore, the first column cell is as wide as Rio de Janeiro. And city is centered over top of that space. So this column is this big, and city is centered over top of it. What's the biggest thing in the January column? the JAM for January, all right? So this column is this wide, and January is centered within that column. Same thing with February and March. Now, you may ask yourself, what if I don't want those headers to be centered and bold? The table data, for example, is not bold, and left aligned. What if I want the table data to be centered? Or the table data to be right aligned? Or this not to be bold? Or whatever. CSS. CSS. That should be an automatic answer for you. You don't even need to know. Like, what I say after I say I want it to look different. All right? If I say I want it to look, look different, boom, the answer is through CSS. So, remember, there's two things 
that determine the way your page looks and all the things on your page look. One of the things that determines it are the defaults of the browser. So in other words, the defaults of the browser make THs bold and centered, make TDs left aligned and not bold, make the columns as big as they need to be, and by that I mean as big as the biggest entry in those columns. So that's the browser's default rules for tables. So by, by uh, association, then, the row is going to be, how big is the row? The row is going to be um, as wide as the sum of the, the biggest columns. So in other words, you know, city, uh, Rio is the biggest thing here, Jan, February, March. So that's how wide the rows are, and that's how wide the table is. The table is going to be as wide as it needs to be to fit in all the rows. Now, of course, we can change this. We can change anything about it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play a little bit with the CSS of this, just to make this look a little better. Because, I mean, this is okay, but look how much space we have. And the table is only taking up a fraction of that space. All right? So what I could do is I could do something like this. And again, in this example, I'm going to put my CSS right in my web page. That does not mean that you should do this. It's better to use an external file, because with an external file, you can apply it to more than one page. But just to make it simpler for me to teach and simpler for you to, to learn and to see, I'm going to put it as part of this page. So. If I want to make the, the, the page big, or the table bigger, I can do that a couple different ways. All right? Let's explore how I can do it. One way I could do it is make each TH bigger. I could give each TH a width. My spell is the question. Width of... 150 pixels. Alright. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make each one of these be 150 pixels wide. So, this right now is not 150 pixels wide, so it's going to make these wider. This I don't think is 150 pixels wide, so it's going to make all four of those columns wider. So, boom. That's what we get. What's another way that we could, what's another way do you think that we could make the table wider? What this did is this made each TH 150 pixels, so now that's the biggest thing in each row. Yes, in each column. Pardon me? Padding. Yeah, we absolutely could do that. So let's, let's try that. Let's put padding on the TH and the TD. So I'll do a padding of 10 pixels. I'll do that on the TH, and I'll do it on the TD. So yeah, that made it bigger. I could also make it bigger by making the table itself bigger. So I could say make the table 800 pixels wide. table 800 pixels wide. Now, which column is the widest of this? The city column. Why do you think that's the widest? All I said was make the table 800 pixels wide. I didn't say anything about making any of the, the columns any wider. 
why is city the widest of all of them? Well, what was widest when we had no CSS? So when I had no CSS about the table, what was widest? City. City was widest. So if I put a width on the table, it's still going to keep that proportion of which one is the widest. So it's going to make the, the city is still going to be the widest. Now, what do you think is going to happen if I do this? I'm going to make THs have a width of 100 pixels. Let's think about that. I'm giving the browser contradicting instructions. Right? I'm saying make the whole table 800 pixels wide. But I'm making each TH only 100 pixels wide. That doesn't add up, right? Because there's only four THs. So that's only 400 pixels. So I'm giving my browser impossible instructions to follow. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, in a nutshell, it's going to take a shot. It's, it's, going to, it's going to try to do as much as it could. My guess is it will be it will make it 800 pixels wide, and it will try its best to make the, the, the THs even. So let's see. Let me save this. That's exactly what it did. It knows that you want the whole table to be 800 pixels wide, so it did that. It knows that you want all your THs even, so it did that. It's not able to make the THs only 100 pixels wide because that would contradict the whole table being 800 pixels wide. So if you give the browser conflicting commands, it takes a shot and comes up with something. All right? And the funny thing is, is usually it does a great job with that. All right? Usually it does a pretty good job. I mean, hey, at least it didn't, like, you know, crash or pound its head on the desk and say, I just can't do this. Why are you asking me to do this? And so on and so forth. Right? Those would be bad responses. Now, the other thing I can do, we're going we're gonna to wrap this up in a, in a minute here. I do want to finish this thought, is I can give the width in terms of percentages. So I can say make the width of this, instead of 800 pixels, I could say maybe make the width of this 80% of the screen. And the width of the THs, I could say make each TH 25%. Now, the THs are inside the table. So when I say 25%, it means 25% of the table. Whenever I give a percentage, it's the percentage of whatever contains it. So if I say I want the THs to be 25%, that's not 25% of the whole screen. That's 25% of the space that the table is taking up. So if I do that, then I get this. And as I resize the window, I can make it bigger or smaller. Now, if I get to a certain point, notice what happens. Los Angeles and Rio, because they have spaces in them, they break down and go to two lines. It's actually pretty clever of the browser to do that, right? The browser isn't going to cut off data. So even if you give instructions that might cause the data be, to be cut off, it's not going to do that. All right? It's going to keep it... Um, the, the proper, it's going to make sure that all the data gets seen. All right, uh, in class on Thursday, what we will do is we will play more with styling of tables because we've just really scratched the surface of the styling of tables. So we're going to do all kinds of cool things to make the tables more understandable. Why do you put style on your tables? You do that for the same reason that you style anything, to make it more functional, to make it easier to read and to understand. All right? Yes? Um, can you put images in tables? Yes. Like, with links? Yes. Absolutely. In fact, a lot of time, like when you do a search for something, like let's say you were uh, did a search on Amazon. I don't know exactly what Amazon search results, so we'll pretend. 
right? The first column might be an image of the product that you've searched for, and then there might be the description and the price. So well, you, for my project, I'm doing a, I have a company, so I'm trying to. Right. And I was just thinking I could have the products and each image be a link to. Absolutely. Page where it has a description. I didn't know if I could make a table for that. Absolutely. If it's a list of things, yes, absolutely. With rows and columns, you can make a table. All right, so we'll do more styling with this. We'll also talk about the accessibility issues associated with tables. And we'll conclude by doing some advanced table stuff. Um, all right. I'm going to go and unlock the lab, then I need to come back here and get the files, and I will be back in the lab after that. So we'll see you then.